My name is Alexander Impolsky. I'm a CEO of Security Scorecard, the leading security rating platform in the world. In this video series called Security DNA, I'm going to talk to people from all walks of life, board members, CIOs, CISOs, industry innovators, about what cybersecurity means to them and the latest trends. Welcome. So it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Neil Daswani to the Security DNA uh, video program. Neil is a former SVP and CISO of Symantec. He was a CISO of LifeLock. Uh, he's been a director in advanced security at Stanford. And most recently, Neil has published a book called a Big uh, Breaches. So it's a pleasure to have you, Neil. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, Alex. Absolutely uh, thrilled to be here today. And uh, you know, I have uh, I have enjoyed roles like being the uh, SCP and CISO at Semantics Consumer Business Unit, in addition to a bunch of the other roles that you mentioned. Uh, it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a ride in the industry so far, and I think that ride's probably going to continue. So Neil, my first question is: In your upcoming book, you looked at hundreds of data breaches going back to 2013, and so based on your research, I have two questions. So the first is. What do you think the common ground is? Could you make an assertion about what are usually the typical root causes for the breaches? And then the second question is, how could security ratings help improve resilience and minimize the likelihood of a data breach? Both very, very good questions. Let me start with the first one. So in doing the research for this book, um, uh, I studied not only the root causes of the mega breaches that started in 2013 with Target and JP Morgan Chase and a whole bunch of others, but also looked at over 9,000 reported breaches to date uh, from data from privacyrights.org and the identity theft, uh, you know, our research center, uh, resource center rather. And given all of those breaches, both the mega breaches as well as the uh, smaller but many thousands reported breaches, there are six technical root causes behind all these breaches that, that are kind of the common ground. And those are some of which you might expect, some maybe not, but the six are phishing, malware, unencrypted data, software vulnerabilities, third-party compromise or abuse, and inadvertent employee mistakes. If you nail those six things, you your chance of getting breached will be much, 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 much lower than it would be otherwise. And while CISOs are working to fight um, to check hundreds of compliance checkboxes, whether it be PCI, ISO 27000, FedRAMP, or whatever, it's really these six factors that are work in uh, not only mega breaches, but smaller breaches as well. Does that make sense? No, that's actually quite interesting and, and makes perfect sense, right? That's back, back to the basics. That's right, that's right, back to the basics. And, you know, you, you asked about security uh, ratings. Um, I, I do think that security rating services have a important role to play in helping the world become a more secure place. Now, I want to mention that th there, there's probably a bunch of different audiences that we might have here. One audience that we might have is uh, the audience of CISOs. And there's probably two kinds of CISOs. There's one kind of CISO uh, or one you know, type of CISO, I wouldn't say type, but you know, a set of CISOs that received their first security ratings report and the grade was not good. And so they might have an immediate uh, non-positive reaction uh, to that, but I, encourage everybody to, to put a hold on, you know, any emotional reaction that might occur. And uh, I let me also mention that I was probably in a second set of CISOs where, you know, I received the initial security ratings report, and it was good, and we made it better. And, you know, when you're talking to regulators, when you're talking to other folks that you're trying to prove you have good security too, right? Uh, there is a lot of value in having a objective third party come up with the ratings uh, because, you know, you might have your own internal dashboards, you might have your own internal metrics. And I think that's good. You should have that. At the same time, 
uh, those are going to be viewed as biased by any third party that you're trying to speak to the quality of your security about. Um, so I do think that, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book and that my co-author and I, Moody and I, we, we came to agreement on is seven habits for organizational security. One of those habits uh, is automate everything. And another habit is to measure everything. The great thing about security ratings is they are both automated and they quantitatively measure things. And so I think, you know, uh, these security ratings, if you can show good external security posture, you can show good security hygiene, that is a positive thing. And uh, as, as you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of security scorecard, um, both, uh, you know, your company as well as my company were uh, funded by Google Ventures and congrats to you on growing out such a immense, important company um, and taking it, uh, you know, across the full ride here. Um, I, I, would, I would say there's a bunch of great things that one can learn about in their external security posture, some of which might just be hygienic, but others which talk about critical vulnerabilities that need to get fixed. And I think that uh, as the industry evolves and matures, the more that these security ratings can measure the root causes of breach, uh, the better off uh, we'll be with regards to not only demonstrating good external security posture, but showing a strong mix of internal and external countermeasures that are predictive and analytical and help prevent breach. I know you're, you've been working with insurance companies as well, which is great to hear. So overall, I think security ratings have a very, very important role to play in making the world a more secure place. No, thank you, Neil. So let's maybe uh, gear shift to third-party risk management a bit. So you've been a CISO and you dealt with the challenges of always having to do more with uh, less. If I were to ask you to go back to your first few weeks at LifeLock, and I remember you telling me how the third-party risk management program was an area that needed attention. How did you decide what to prioritize? Uh, did you prioritize people, process, technology? Could you talk about your process of coming up with your 30, 60, 90 day plan when you joined Life, uh, LifeLock as a CISO and just started deciding what to focus on? Sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, as I mentioned, when I joined LifeLock, uh, the, the goal was to take its security from good to great. And we did that using a bunch of different third party uh, metrics. And there were a number of areas where we improved the program. One of those areas was the third party management program. And one of the challenges about working with third parties is that there can be a lot of them. Um, there can be some that are more critical than others. For instance, if you're giving any sensitive data to a third party that might make it more critical, but it's important to be able to, if you wanna get a very quick inventory and take stock of what does the security of your supply chain look like, which is only becoming more important in the aftermath of the solar winds hack. Um, if you wanna do that, one thing you can do is you can spend the first 30 days just getting an assessment of not only your, your own security ratings, but getting the security ratings of all of the different third parties that you work with. And you can get a sense for which of those third parties have security that at least from their external posture seems commensurate to yours and which ones do not. So, you know, I'd say that after getting some initial assessment within, within 30 days, the next step is in 60 days to understand uh, which of the most critical third parties do you need to, do you need to work with. Uh, to put them on a roadmap to further improve their security. And I would say that there are a whole variety of ways that you can do that prioritization. But one of the things you can do is just look at the, look at the technical data and look at the scores and, and, and go from there. And I'd say that you know in the 90-day in the mark, you should be at a point where you can start uh, having them remediate some of their issues. I think that in general, doing efforts where folks try to use questionnaires to third parties or try to do a manual vetting or ask for an audit, those things all take quite a bit of time. 
So using security ratings to give you an initial sense of what your third party supply chain posture looks like uh, is a very reasonable, very reasonable thing to do. No, that's great advice. So as security practitioners, we spend a lot of time thinking about other people, other teams. Uh, how, do you, how do we make non-cybersecurity uh, people understand cybersecurity? And I think your book will go and do an excellent job at helping that. Uh, but also, you know, we might not spend enough time thinking about the reverse problem. How do you make cybersecurity practitioners more business savvy? So you've got a kind of a dual progress. Uh, problem, making business folks understand cybersecurity and making cybersecurity folks understand business. So what's been your experience in trying to advocate for those both things uh, and just kind of implementing change to make it possible? Very good, very good questions. And le let me mention that one of the reasons that uh, my co-author, Moody Albadi, and I decided to write Big Breaches was because there was not we feel that hasn't been enough information shared about all the things that have gone wrong in the field. And I think that if you look at any business, um, its goal is to be optimistic and altruistic and try to grow the top line as much as possible. And I'd say that the best cybersecurity people are those that are enablers. They figure out um, that they're not the department of no, uh, what they do is when the business wants to go in a particular direction, the ideal answer is yes. And how can we do that in a way that mitigates risk, right? So in, in the Big Breaches book, one of the things that we do is we spend the first half of the book going through the histories and the stories of some of the biggest breaches over the past seven years, whether it be uh, Target, JP Morgan Chase, OPM, Yahoo, Equifax, uh, hacks and breaches at Facebook up through, up through Capital One. And we give a understanding in plain English of what happened and what went wrong. And with regards to educating more people about the business of cybersecurity, that's one of the reasons that we do that. Now we spend the second half of the book talking about a roadmap to recovery and we give advice to security and technology professionals in one of those chapters. And what we encourage them to do to become more business savvy is to put on the hat of a general manager, put on the hat of a general manager who is a, or an executive that's supposed to help with growing the business and try to view as many of the efforts that you're doing along those lines. Maybe some of your initiatives will help uh, prevent incidents or compromise or hacks or breaches that will avoid the business from getting distracted and stay on a constant growth path. But I would encourage uh, security and technology people to figure out how to be enabler. So for instance, if you are pursuing HIPAA compliance, uh, well, you know, the, the enablement story around that is that you're helping open the company to being able to sell to a new large market, which it may not have been able to do before. And that should be the focus, the growth. And how are you enabling that growth? Now you have to do a whole bunch of things to mitigate risk. Um, but that should be the, the, the second uh, follow-up rather than what you lead with. Super useful stuff. So I guess um, my last question uh, is, let's say you were to start a startup in cybersecurity space. Uh, what area is interesting for you? Like, what do you feel like are some interesting untapped opportunities uh, where innovation could go help solve them? Well, I think I think there's a lot of um, open such areas, and 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 to tell you the truth, you know, when we had first chatted back in 2016, you know, if I if I wasn't uh, CISO at LifeLock and I was in entrepreneur mode like I was in the past, uh, you know, it would have been a great area to enter. Of course, I would have been afraid to compete with you, um, but <laughs> but overall, I, I think um, you know, areas where you quantitatively measure security are a, are a, are a good are a good area. You know, I would say though that there's some areas that may be sufficiently invested, um, and there's a lot of great security ratings companies uh, there today, security scorecard included. Um, but there are a bunch of other areas that are very underinvested. So one of the things that we do in the book is we understand in a chapter about cybersecurity investments where the 45 billion dollars invested in cybersecurity has gone to date, um, which you know what's the root cause of breaches. 
And where should we invest going forward if we're going to continue to get the biggest bang for the buck? And what that means, you know, is that, you know, some areas like, uh, you know, mobile security might be sufficiently invested, but areas like Internet of Things security or areas like privacy are very underinvested. Of the 45 billion that's been invested in cybersecurity to date, about 11 billion has gone into network security, which is a necessary but not sufficient defense. On the other hand, you have areas like Internet of Things security where you have billions of devices that are coming online and there's only been 1.5 billion invested over the past 15 years in that area. So, so that's an area that's lucrative. And if we look at areas like privacy, and you know, this is based on data from Crunchbase and Pitchbook. Uh, if we look at if we look at data on areas like privacy, there's only less than two billion that have been invested into companies that tag themselves and categorize themselves as focusing on the privacy problem. Yet in 2019, just one fine that Facebook paid to the Federal Trade Commission in the amount of $5 billion exceeds the amount of investment that's gone in that sub area by more than two and a half. So, uh, you know, in that book on advice to cybersecurity investors, it's probably not only useful to investors, but it's probably useful for entrepreneurs too. If you're figuring out what you want to do next in the area of cybersecurity, that's a great chapter to read to learn more about what's been um, underinvested, sufficiently invested, as well as overinvested. So the book is called Big Breaches, Cybersecurity Lessons for Everyone. It's coming out in March 2021, so just a couple of months away. So get your copy, pre-order it before it runs out. So Neil, thank you very much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me, Alex.